Sound is all around us. Say, those vibrations travel pretty fast, don't they, Phil? Sound is all around us, everywhere. That's for me, the nature of sound. Hello and welcome to Sean and Dave Make Music. I'm Sean, and this month Dave and I spoke with Anthony DeAngelis, an incredibly talented and creative music director, pianist, composer, and orchestrator based in New York City. He also hosts a really fun weekly podcast called Let Me Ask You a Question, which you'll hear a little more about in our interview. I'll put the link to that show in the episode notes along with Anthony's website so you can follow him there and hear more of his work. We recorded this episode remotely, so we generated fewer tracks than usual, but we've got a few samples of Anthony's to show off to make up for it, and they're really great, so I don't think you're going to be disappointed by the end of this one. Make sure you do stick around till the end, though, because uh, you'll want to hear what we came up with, and there's going to be another opportunity for a little bit of bonus content if you're really dying to hear more. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to Sean and Dave Make Music. We've got our guest tonight, uh, not in the same room as us, but it's not on. It's not night either. This, I'm the worst at intros. <laughs> you never know but when they're listening. Let's Could just, be night. Let's just keep them. Um, yeah, it's good morning world. It's Sean and Dave Make Music <laughs> with Anthony DeAngelis, and it's now the people that are listening at night are going to be like, he didn't. He really doesn't get me. <laughs> well, you know, it, the, the transition from night to morning is so amorphous. Who knows when it's? Maybe they're listening at two o'clock in the morning. Morning, and, and I'm really just speaking right to him. <laughs> yeah, or maybe it's one of the uh, like the, the blue night in the in the great Arctic Circle. Yeah, yeah. So, we have a know, lot of this listeners. Is, this goes out to we them. should cover a bunch of bases. <laughs> we have a lot of listeners yeah. in the Arctic Circle. Hello, everybody <laughs> doing laundry right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Hi, Dan. <laughs> Let's Dan. just list everything that you could possibly be doing right now so we cover all our bases. <laughs> well, the important thing is that you're listening to our podcast, and we really appreciate it. Um, we've got another uh, veteran podcaster with us and also veteran musician, Anthony DeAngelis. I first met Anthony in high school. Uh, we both went went to East Stroudsburg North, uh, ENS, East Stroudsburg North. And uh, <laughs> I didn't know you all that well in high school, but, you know, we, we crossed here we are. paths several times. And now we're, we're podcast friends. We're making up for lost time. Indeed. It's nice. I love it. Thank nice you for having your me. Again. You're yep. welcome. <laughs> um, so we we made a little bit of music, and we're gonna make some more. We we kind of the catalyst for this project was the Not Movies episode that we did, which is my other podcast where we make up fake movies, and it's usually far sillier than this show. Um, <laughs> so that that might bleed into here a little bit because I feel like we're I'm I don't know in I'll have been on all your podcasts. Indeed. True. That's so exciting. And you're not the only one. Dave oh. has also been on Have not. I been? Oh. Dave has also been on Not Movies, so. That's true. Oh, c- congrats. Congrats, it, Dave. And my brother was also on both. We need to get t-shirts made. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the uh, oh, what's that called when you get the Grammy Oscar Tony? The uh, EGOT. The EGOT. <laughs> this is our EGOT of podcasting. <laughs> Uh, but only Absolutely. mine. <laughs> only my podcasts. Yeah, exactly. Those Gatt. are the only important podcasts. <laughs> oh, yep. That's, uh, thank you for stroking my ego right off the bat here. I'll stroke your ego any day. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit, since, since we're on the topic of your podcast. It's called Let Me Ask You a Question, and it's really fun. It's, I think it's the epitome of just like a, a perfect like time waster podcast. You're probably not going <laughs> to learn anything. You might. There's there's a demon sometimes that that comes in with interesting facts. Occasionally yeah. you'll tackle the a, a big issue. I like the serious uh, the serious episodes, but they're kind of few and far between. It's just definitely true. <laughs> it's just a good good enjoyable uh, way to turn off your brain and th- think about something else other than what's going on in the world. That's definitely what I do when I record. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I turn my brain right off and just and just really let the diarrhea flow from my mouth. It's nice to have a for space. A half an hour. It's nice to have a space to do that and and if people listen to you even better. <laughs> yeah. There are weirdly some listeners out there and I find that unbelievable. I thought I could name everybody. I can't name everybody. That's, that's crazy to me. That's great. <laughs> yep. Well, I'm one of your loyal fans. I've listened to all the episodes and uh I've actually been on a few as well. So uh, oh, we need to start a mutual admiration society. Our listeners can go listen to those too. That's a good place to start if you already like my voice. 
<laughs> Which we do. We love your voice. So let's talk a little bit about the origin story of, of Lamayak before we get into your musical career. What, Absolutely. What, made, what inspired you to start the podcast? And have you thought at all about or have you intentionally kept your podcasting life separate at all from your musical career, especially since it is so silly and raunchy and you guys really kind of leave it all on the table in some of those episodes? Is that something you've thought about or considered or not really? <laughs> when do you hear the next episode? Oh, boy. <laughs> EJ, we get into the, the nitty gritty of EJ's sex life, oh, and that's boy. wonderful. Uh, all right, what's the, or the origin story? So basically, producer EJ5000 and I, who's my co-host, and Greg Amann, all went to school. I met Eric way back in first grade. I met Greg probably shortly after because he was close to Eric. So we've been friends for a very, very, very long time. And a few years ago, I got a phone call from Eric, and he said, well, do you want to do a podcast? And I was like, yes, absolutely, I want to do a podcast. He was starting up his own domain called Moot.TV, and he was some, trying to get some shows together. And he calls me up, and he says to me, he says... How about doing a podcast? And I said, sure. What's it about? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> like, he got, like, angry with me, like, uh, as though I should know that. And, and so uh, I came up kind of spur of the moment with the, an idea that I, I figured my whole life, if you were to ever ask my girlfriend Meredith about this, she is a testament to just nonstop questions all the time about things that will mean nothing to anybody ever. And so I needed another outlet for that. And so it was good because I could use producer ej5000 and the greg man is human punching bags for words basically and i could just say whatever i want and it's wonderful because they humor me it was very kind of them and it gives me a platform to be an idiot and i like that platform because i find being an idiot comes very natural to me i, I sympathize with you on that heart I, I i feel the same way i love to just be an idiot sometimes and <laughs> and and also have that be separate from the things that i like to not be an idiot about so you were talking about being very meticulous with your music and i and i I, yeah, I, I identify that. I identify with you on that pretty hard, you know, keeping absolutely. The, a line I think a lot of musicians, and... for sure. It's just, there's a, you know, it, we're all like precious little eggshells, <laughs> 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 basically. And so, but music, vis a vis music uh, with Lamayak, we do try uh, because if you listen to our earlier episodes, it was always kind of uh, infomercials or commercials from the 1940s and 50s, like early TV sounds mm -hmm. and advertisements that are public domain and we've actually tried in the last year to start doing little snippets even if they're 10 20 seconds of songs to put in our little middle section in the, on the break and so we have tried actually and for me it was about kind of learning logic it was a platform mm -hmm. to learn logic a little bit more or learn ableton a little bit more and just kind of come up with stupid little things that we could pop in instead of using stuff that already existed at least it's some kind of an outlet and what I'm hoping for in the future, and EJ, I hope you're listening, is that we start collaborating a little bit more on them. That would be really nice. But usually it's like I come up with an idea or EJ comes up with an idea and we just kind of plop it in. I got but you. if it's if another way to do exactly what we're going to do for this episode, just kind of collaborate, uh, making little snippets and then figuring something out together, that would be ideal for me. Yeah, cool. I think that's uh, a good way to go. And I like the little snippets. I, I have to say, I really liked the old, <laughs> old timey things too, especially when oh, they I like related the old -timey to the things episodes. too. We have to find out a way to combine them. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, well, you could you could make like an old timey sounding uh, ditty. That's what we need to do. We need to do something like Run music concrete. Mm. Oh, well, like the Internet Archives. You could just Exa yeah, yeah, plunder exactly. That. That's it's what so Eric used. Fun. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Or finding, like, you know, just finding old commercials on YouTube and cutting them up and, and, and shit like that. So, we, yeah, we should combine them. That's a good idea. Yeah, I like that. Have you um, always had kind of a, a good separation between your silly side and your practice side, you know, your, your serious musician side? Or did someone have to sit you down and say, you need to buckle down and start practicing the piano? And if so, when did that happen? Oh, it's funny. I did have... Hmm. There's a lot of facets to this question. In my undergrad, which was fine. Uh, <laughs> Where did you go? <laughs> I went to Penn State. Okay. Uh, and it was kind of fine. I don't, I, in retrospect, I always feel like I probably should not have, have gone there. But I did get into theater because I went there. Mm. So it did have a bearing on the kind of choices that I made later on. 
but I went there to be a composer. But as far as piano goes, I used to play for all the choruses. And, you know, I always, I, I enjoy being the class clown type. And so I would, I would get into a little trouble. And then I did have a little come to Jesus with the choir director, who I, I had great respect for. It was probably the only person that I really uh, gleaned any life information from while I was at Penn State. And he said to me, uh, you know, basically, this obviously comes pretty natural to you. You're, you can so you read your way through most things, and you don't have to practice. But if you actually spend some time, <laughs> then you're going to go right to the top. And so, but, you know, he said it in a very, uh, it was a very serious way. And it did have an impact on me. I, I thought, you know, you know, maybe I'll practice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so uh, I have a, I have an interesting relationship with practice that we can we can get into. But um, but anyways, yeah, I did have that moment. So there was somebody in my life telling me that. But as far as like, can I, do you curse on this yeah, show? Yeah, do yeah, I not curse? It. It's fine. Okay. As, as far as my general fuckery, I the best case scenario ever at any job that I could ever possibly have is the ability to be myself. And there's a lot of of course anxiety wrapped up in being a musician because you, I feel as though I have to earn. I have to earn the ability to be myself because myself is a weird little man. <laughs> and to, in order to be a weird little man, I feel like I have to be really excellent at work or else I can't. There's only so much fuckery you can get, get away, away with yeah, if you're yeah. not good at your job, you know? <laughs> totally. Then you become just an asshole. And so I live in constant fear of just being an asshole. There's such a fine line. <laughs> it's a fine line. It is a fine line, my friend. And, and so, you know, it did have... It did have an effect, and I think every ever ever since then, as far as theater gigs go, I I kind of have a fiendish relationship with practice. But it's also the only time I practice. Okay, I mean, I think that is okay. You know, like the focus on when it counts and make sure you're rock solid and. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. You don't need it's to be weird. practicing Rachmaninoff if you don't need to be playing Rachmaninoff. Ah, uh, but if only I could play Rachmaninoff. <laughs> I always say that to myself, but then, do I practice Rachmaninoff? No. <laughs> but it exists in the world of possibility. Yeah. So, do you have the hands for Rachmaninoff? Also, it's the hell no. I got <laughs> you tiny, weird little man. <laughs> I got tiny little stupid mice hands, <laughs> and I can I can barely I can't even reach tenth. I have no tenth. Oh, so yeah. jazz voicings are all fucked because I can't, like, I, I only have a little ninth, so I got to do all the right hand work, and I got to, like, jump around and leave notes out. It's unbelievable. Well, maybe if you and practice never, like, harder and buckle their hands, down, I never you'd be did able that. to get that tenth. <laughs> yeah, you're right. If I actually spent time actually practicing, maybe I could get that tenth. But as it is, it's like, I feel like I can barely hold an acorn. <laughs> First up tonight. And for me, it actually is night at this point. I'm recording uh, a night. So hi, all night people. Earlier we were recording in the morning, but uh, it's night now. We've got a song from Anthony's family musical, The Prince's New Pet. It's called Enjoy the View. Your mother used to say, Look, Look my, my darling, darling. It's, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful, colorful, colorful day. day. The world can astound you. If you look at the color all around you Yellow sunlight fills the courtyard As the crimson leaves blow through What a perfect, vibrant morning Enjoy the view See our sun, his green eyes gleaming He has rosy cheeks like you since he won't be small forever, enjoy the view. And she smiled, and rainbows flew by, a shining and shimmering sky. I'd sigh, and then she'd say, Look at you and me, my darling, if the sky is gray or blue. I'll be there to see it with you, enjoy the view. She grew sick and days grew colder, and the sickness only grew. Bluebirds sang outside her window, enjoy the view. 
I brought violets to her bedside, and she loved the vibrant hue. On the last day we would ever enjoy the view. She was gone, and I couldn't bear the color I saw everywhere. For there I saw her face. So I banished every rainbow, and I banned the blue sky too. For I knew that I could never enjoy the view. Well, <laughs> I think you're you're making it work pretty well. Yeah, you, I fake I'm faking it till I make it. You seem to be pretty relentlessly busy, and and uh, so. How's that going? Like, what, what, for you, what's your favorite part of what you get to do? Is it, is it the composing or arranging or orchestrating? Is it the actual playing? Is it directing people? What's, what's your favorite part of your job, which encompasses all these different things? <laughs> directing people is a lot of fun. You ever, do you remember Kids in the Hall? Oh, of the course. Show the Kids yeah. in the Hall? Do you remember the, the Sizzler Sisters? No. Not off the top of like, my head, no. Uh, they were doing a song and dance act, and they would say to the audience when they wanted them to sing, they would go, sing, pricks! <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you get to say that to a group of people, it's always really nice. Okay. And then they have to sing. So it is wonderful to direct people. But that, no, no, I, I'm very much like a moth to the light with a kind of whatever's in front of me. Whatever's the closest thing in front of me kind of interests me. For instance, I came off a gig for the last month and a half that was just kind of teaching teaching kids and, and, and I was music directing some little workshops and things like that. Basically, it was for kids that were looking to get casting directors and agents to look at them. And this program kind of books a lot of child stars on Broadway and doing TV stuff. And so I was kind of on the, the staff or, 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 or faculty there. And, uh, and so it was very gregarious. I was around people nonstop, which is the most amazing thing for fuckery. <laughs> and I love the fuckery aspect because if I can go to work and just be a goofball and... And that's the best thing to do with kids too. They want you to be a goofball and... Uh, right? Yeah, it oh, totally, totally works for the kiddos, <laughs> minus the cursing. But, you know, I, I love the gregarious side. I love being around people. I love talking to people all day long. I could talk all day long. Like my heaven is a diner. <laughs> and where you're just sitting and chatting all day. It, there's nothing better in the world. So when I can be in a situation where I'm constantly around people and can talk, I love that. But then on the other side, like now this month, I'm going to kind of spend orchestrating and writing charts. And it's just plenty of alone time. And now this is fun for me. So I think there, you know, there's a combo platter for sure. There's not one thing. Part of the death of me is that I, I'm killed by possibility. Mm. Possibility destroys me because I, I never know what I like. I like everything that I do. And then at the same time, you know, I, I, mean, I have collaborators and I compose. And so there's that side of my brain. Then there's the orchestrator side of my brain. There's the music. Like Dan Pardo, because I heard the podcast that you did with Dan Pardo. Mm -hmm. There's so many different hats that you have to wear. And if you kind of don't love them all, that can be a blessing. But it could also hurt you in the world of theater because you have to do so much shit. So... Uh, you know, it's a weird, it's a weird question in so much as I kind of love, I kind of love different parts of it all. That makes sense. I mean, I, I, you're right. You have to love everything that you're doing. Otherwise, I mean, I, I guess that sucks if there's just one aspect of it that you like, <laughs> why are you doing this job? So that's great that you love the whole thing. And yeah, but on the other side of that coin, you know, you look at people that said, okay, I'm going to be an orchestrator or I'm going to be a pianist. And sometimes they have the most success because they fucking decided <laughs> i never decided right you know most i'm, a, success, I'm a, getting to be middle-aged most success maybe not the most fun yeah maybe not the most fun absolutely i mean i do like i like putting on all the hats and trying them on and seeing what's fit what fits and doesn't fit are there um are there other, any other instruments that you have spent serious time learning other than the piano do you do you have a secondary instrument there was a time where I thought I would take it upon myself to learn the guitar. That was a few years ago. And I'll tell you one thing. I wish I played the guitar. Because <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I practiced for a long time, and I, I, I'm able to play some things on the guitar now. 
I could probably play very rudimentary things. If you gave me a chord chart, I could kind of figure it out. It would take me a minute, but I could probably probably figure it out. And I got really into finger picking mm. because it's, I felt to me that was the most related to the piano. Yeah, you've got like that I dexterity understood how already. harmony works that way better. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know what's really nice? There's something that's awfully boring about the piano, and I kind of hate it as an instrument. I just happen to make my living off of it. Uh, because of the timbre. The timbre is all just so uniform. It's a completely utilitarian instrument in that it can do everything. It can rival an orchestra. Everybody needs it for everything. And I don't relate to it almost at all. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> and so the guitar, I loved that you keep it on your person. There's something so much more sensual about it. Hmm. And I, I felt a little bit more connected immediately when I got into it. I and mean, when I started playing, it was just, I was nonstop finger pick, picking and learning, you know, Bob Dylan songs and just watching infinite episodes of Seinfeld and kind of mindlessly, slowly, <laughs> meticulously with a metronome finger picking songs. And there's something that feels so good about the guitar and the sound is so beautiful and varied. And it just made me go, damn, I blew it. <laughs> <laughs> However, the piano, it also will get you in the room anywhere because it's such an instrument that everybody needs. And I, th and I and think of it's course, such an instrument that... Pianists. Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think there are a lot fewer really competent pianists than really competent guitarists. Uh, or, right. Yeah, there are more competent guitarists than competent pianists, I think. So Ma yeah, I think that's I an asset. That. For sure. Um but yeah, it was just a mind-blowing experience because I said, oh, this is really nice to have an instrument that actually feels a part of you. You know, there's something mm, alien about the piano because it exists in space. It's out there in front of you. And you don't you, take your own to a gig. So you don't develop a relationship with uh, on a per-instrument basis except for your pra whatever you practice on at home. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just kind of, there's something a little bit sterile about the piano. I, I see that. I think definitely like, the guitar and the bass... Um, for those, I just the feeling of controlling the timbre in your fingertips, so like yeah. to such a degree, and you can just milk a note. The subtlety is yeah, is so the much possibilities different. are so much. Yeah, yeah doesn't it just make you feel way more alive? The piano, <laughs> you sit and you, you just feel like I don't know, like you're doing a math equation. <laughs> That's well, it, yeah. The other thing, I mean, like I, I I started on guitar and then percussion and bass, but like the. the the thing for guitar that always gets me when I move over to piano is if I'm comping chords on the piano, it just turns into like my hands are more or less moving around in the shapes of the chords while I'm playing a drum pattern with my hands. <laughs> like, yeah, like, right. Like whereas the guitar, you can get so much subtlety with different strumming patterns that you can get so much more involved. The piano, I feel like, well, here's my C chord. I guess I could do some inversions, but... It's more yeah. about the rhythm, the just bouncing around to keep it sounding lively. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that there, that is absolutely correct in how the kind of piano functions. But you know, and, and not to disparage people that play piano wonderfully, because you know, I, oh, some of beastly. my favorite music is piano music. I just find it, in the grand scheme of things, to be an utterly boring instrument. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think. The next time you have a big chunk of time on your hands, you should try the flute because that's an even better instrument than the guitar. <laughs> it's even more personal, and you've got even more possibilities and more subtlety, and it, it's a really fun instrument to experiment with and to See? to play. This is what with. I need. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I feel like I have like a, a blank canvas when I when I play the flute, and I can put the sound wherever I want to and make it. be Do you I connect want. the most to that instrument of all the instruments? Absolutely. That you play. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a huge part of it is just that I, I started on that and, th you know, that's what I've put thousands more hours into than anything else. Yeah, right. But I I think objectively it, it also is gives you more tonal possibilities. And I think, you know, even if I were to put thousands more hours into the saxophone, I think I would still enjoy playing the flute significantly more. What, what drew you to the flute initially? Uh, I had a crush on a girl. <laughs> yes, this is why I started playing piano. Really? <laughs> Producer EJ5000, the Eric, he says to me, when we were both, I started late, it started when I was 12. He said, girls will like you if you play the piano. And I said, that's a good enough re a reason as any to start playing the piano. And that's, that's totally why I started. And then I just kind of got uh, very weirdly, extremely obsessed with it. That, yeah, that's sort of what happened to me. Mine was a specific girl that I liked in fourth grade. And I was like, maybe if I play the flute, I'll get to sit next to her. 
And then it worked out. No, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it worked out. <laughs> I mean, in a way, yes, it worked out. I, I found the instrument that I feel like is right for me. But but no, it didn't work out with that girl. Thankfully, yeah. did not work out with the girl. Okay, all right. Well, you you gave it the old college try, yeah. and you got you got a lifetime career out of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think it worked. That's out. That's not so bad. I think you nailed it. I think so. Next up, a very different sounding example of Anthony's work. This one was the collaboration between him and his Lamayak podcast co-hosts, producer EJ5000 and The Grega Man. It's about perms and I love it.
so we we kind of covered what what you what instrument you would pick in an alternate universe. Can you see yourself in an alternate universe having a non musical job? What would what would that be if you if you were to give it all up and say I'm going to start my new career next week? It's going to be this. It's funny. I ask people this question all the time. It's an interesting question. This is question. one of my favorite questions because I always say to musicians, you know, as soon as our our career goes pear shaped, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? And uh, yeah, I, I guess I can phrase it funny. that way. Not what would you do, but what are you going to do when this all falls through? <laughs> yeah, that's an even better question because it's so much more real. But you know what's crazy? My the, the things that I would possibly do that are not music are just as stupid as doing music for a living. <laughs> you know, for like the things I would be interested in are uh, being a professor of philosophy, which would get you just so much money. <laughs> Uh, or doing something in the world of comedy, you know, like mm-hmm. that, that, I, I think I would enjoy that. I think that'd be fun for me. Also, not lucrative. I don't have one thing that would earn me money. I have no idea what I would do. I, I, I will. I am bound for poverty. Well, regardless of whether music. I mean, if music works out, great. There are times where you make a lot of money, and there's times you make no money. So I've I've gotten the best of both worlds in the music in the scope mm-hmm. of things. But all my other career choices are also shitty. So, you know, I just got to get used to living this tenement life in New York. Well, I think the good news is that with the way, you know, we're, we're going towards automation and things like that, the creative professions maybe will be the ones that will be more in demand. 100%. Unless it's AI I, beats us I think about it. too. <laughs> Wait, say the last part Unless again? AI can just do all of that for us and then we're out of the job too. But we'll see. <laughs> it's, it's funny that you say that because I think about this all the time. I was just talking to Meredith the other night, and I was saying, you know, it's fascinating the way the world is going and kind of, you know, there's not like industrial jobs anymore. It's kind of a post-industrial world where everything, if you don't go to coding school, you don't really have a chance. It's just so much of that kind of work. And I'm saying, oddly, I chose this career in which I have to be in the room playing the piano, and I'm indispensable. And I think I think it would be so difficult to get an AI to say, you know, to have a choreographer say, we're going to pick it up at this measure. And can you, can we do it under tempo? You know, I agree. It's so specific. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and it's a weirdly safe job <laughs> that goes back centuries. Like it kind of blows my mind that in some ways, I think I chose a safer career with the way the world is going technologically and economically. I think in a way you're right. And I think the staying power of Broadway and musicals in general is immense Uh, it's crazy that it's been thriving for as long as it has and is still so popular it seems like every couple years there's a show that really breaks out and is is what you know everybody wants to go see and in between those times it's still good yeah there's always people coming to see it you know it's gotten established this is the reason that i you know i went to school to be a composer at penn state and by the end of that i i said to myself i said uh, this world is a bit of a museum is how I was feeling at the time, like the world of classical composition. And so I switched gears and said, theater is still such a viable art form that people line up for. It's also mm-hmm. something uniquely American. The mm-hmm. idea of musical comedy is something that we developed in America. And so, you know, we don't have tons of culture. I feel like that we call our own. And you could have also argued that the roots of it were borrowed from other traditions, European operetta. But I mean, there's something about musical comedy, the idea of that as a genre that we came up with. And I have great, I'm not the most nationalistic person you're ever going to meet, <laughs> but, but I do take pride culturally that that is something that is uniquely ours. And I said, that's a place that I would like to write for because you can do something interesting. You can tell a story in a genre that is uniquely ours and still have a voice that is at once prevalent and uh, not intangible. You know, it's very, it's very, um, it's not super esoteric. It's relatable. Mm -hmm. There's a word that I need here. But uh, you know what I'm saying. I think so. Do you find that the the world of theater composing is less confining or more confining than the world of serious classical composition? I would say less because the drama dictates everything. So mm. whatever the story is, that's the sound you need to create. And so you don't know what worlds are going to open up because it just it all hinges on what's happening in the libretto and what is the book that we're writing? What is the story that we're going to tell? And that could change everything. It's something I think about all the time because the possibilities are so endless. Not that the world of classical music, the possibilities are not endless 
but I also am probably not the best person to talk to you in so much as I don't like what I don't know what that world is. I can name a handful of living composers that I that I like and listen to or that I'm interested in, but I do wonder about what are the confines of that world. And maybe the answer is that they're none, but I just like the world of theater in so much as you have this you have an, a higher structure that's telling you what what to write. And I find that really interesting. That sure. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also it helps eliminate the, um, like the dilemma of too many choices. Like if you know that the story is going to be the overarching, like we are fitting in this box of the story, then mm -hmm. within that you can then open up a hundred million choices, but at least that first choice is made. So there's not the, with well, not a hundred billion choices. Yeah, exactly. Like it's it's nice. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, I feel like the worst thing for for me when I'm writing a piece is if I have no restraint, no constraints whatsoever. That's the worst feeling in the world. I like to have yeah, a couple it, things where it's like, but we need X, Y, and Z. Keep it to these instruments or this time length or or something. Yeah. Absolutely. If I'm just looking at a blank page, it stays blank forever. <laughs> <laughs> there will not be a time that music goes on that page. <laughs> I'll put a bunch this of shit down. This is also another reason that collaborating with theater is great because you work with people and you're beholden to them. Yeah. Deadlines are a good thing. Deadlines are the best thing in the entire world. Yep. <laughs> I live in such fear of them. You know, like <laughs> I started this orchestrating project and I haven't orchestrated in years. There was a time when I thought I was going to be an orchestra, an orchestrator when I first moved to New York. And I got really into it. And I was orchestrating for the Cincinnati Pops and the New York Pops. And I was like, oh, this is, I love this. I love this career. And then I kind of, got into music directing and then I said, oh, I love this. And now I'm kind of caught in all different worlds. And so a friend of mine had said, can you orchestrate this project? And I said, uh, I was one of those moments where you go, yeah, 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 yeah I can do that. Uh, and so, you know, I kind of, after I got done cleaning the shit out of my pants, I, <laughs> I orchestrated the first song in, in one day. Like I just did the whole thing because I was so stressed out mm -hmm. about having something to show friends so that they can tell me how shitty it is and I can change it. <laughs> uh, and so, but having the deadlines, it makes you do stuff like that, which is a wonderful thing. Yeah. I yeah. think, I think it's definitely a good choice to get it out there and then you can make changes after that. Yeah. I, I, I'm so fascinated by people that can honestly, earnestly just write for themselves and are still industrious. That's just mind blowing to me. <laughs> and wonderful. I'm so jealous of those people. Well, I write, I, I don't know, I, I write things for myself in that not many people listen to them and I don't make any money off of them, but I feel still compelled to make ska music. <laughs> That's, that, but that is an incredible thing. It's the closest I get to that is when I make bullshit for Lamaya, mm. you know, because it's something that's just for me. Uh, there's oddly this weird built in listener group that is going to hear it. Uh, and there's something I, I love about that, but it's still not just. For me, right? You know? yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't make much music that I don't show anybody. Because if it's yeah. good, why not show somebody? Yeah, <laughs> gotta show somebody. Meredith will see everything I ever do. Oh, okay. That's for sure. Summer will not see everything I ever do. <laughs> that's nice, though. I feel like that's good. I think I'm just such a I, I'm just such a whore. <laughs> <laughs> I just need some kind of. You know, some kind of nod Validation. or a smile oh, yeah, yeah. that I exist. Gotcha. Yeah, I subject <laughs> Angie to that a number of times, where if I'm working on a piece, I'll just be like, I worked on this a lot today. I know you don't give a shit, but I'm going to just, <laughs> I'm going to play you two minutes of music, and then I want you to nod and say, that sounded like music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Don't, it's just, you got to scratch that itch a little bit. You got to have somebody acknowledge that you exist in order to exist <laughs> yeah i'll do it with some, sometimes with summer if i'm like almost done mixing something and i'm like okay this might be done i listen to it and let me look, watch your face and <laughs> and maybe it's maybe it sounds like shit but i'm not sure yet so you need to listen to this because i can't I, i'm just like drained right now well actually yeah it, yeah it's good to outsource shit like that and if she says it sounds bad then i know it really sounds bad yep. she doesn't want me to keep working on it well it's, i would be curious so anthony so um because, like, uh, Sean and I both are with people that are not musicians, like, dabble on the side. But, like, uh, with Meredith, is there a... We like, all live with people the, who are not musicians. Yeah, but that's yeah. what I mean. Like, with Meredith, what is your, um, like, what's the, the dynamic like? Because she's actually, like, trained in, in music as well. So, like... Right. So, she's a, she's a musicologist. So, she... It's, a, it's, a, it's the best possible combination I could think of. In so much as we can both geek out and nerd out and talk 
in uh, at least a quasi-intellectual way on my part about <laughs> music, but we never step on each other's toes career-wise. We're so, we're so well clear of each other when oh. it actually comes down to our career paths. But it's interesting because every time I show her something, she has an uh, amazing innate sense of what is good and what is not good and why. For instance, hmm. I showed her this chart that I was working on yesterday, and she rattled off all these notes that when... I showed an actual orchestrator yesterday and he called me up and he was like, let me tell you why this is all terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of it was very similar to what she was saying. And so I do, I trust her horse sense about that. Cool. That's great. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I find it to be like a superpower because I find that she just has really good taste. It's better than mine. My taste is so on the nose. It's like everything is like a big cartoon. <laughs> I, I, I feel like it's just it, it, everything that I do. It's how I play the piano. I feel like it's how I orchestrate. It's kind of, I feel uh, a little like a Fellini film. It's, it's like mm. eating a big bowl of pasta. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if that makes sense. but I, It's so funny. I always I, I say, does this sound like pasta? <laughs> Okay, like to so you're just like carby and indulgent. To one thing, or... <laughs> yeah, like extremely indulgent. Okay, like, I gotcha. Like it's gonna make me a big fat fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and here's another ridiculous little song written by Anthony for "Let Me Ask You a Question." They went through a period of several weeks, maybe months, where they played this song on their break, and it was stuck in my head for pretty much that entire time. Thanks, guys. Strawberries, we're gonna have strawberries tonight. 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 Strawberries, we're gonna have. Strawberries, we're gonna have strawberries tonight. 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 Well, let's talk a little bit about our collaboration that we did. Um, when I Meet the Fonz, which is our, our, our main project that we're <laughs> presenting uh, this, this episode. So it started off as a not movie, which is my other podcast that you were on. And um, we, we came up with this sort of loose story together that I think you and I kind of had different ideas about this character. And, and that often happens on not movies. Like me and Eric are talking about something and like we're both going totally different directions, but we're both fine with it. And like we just have a different idea in our head. And I think that kind of happened because when we started writing lyrics together, you wanted it to be a little darker than I initially so intended it. Okay, you're right. You wanted it to be so much darker than so I originally darker, intended it. Yeah. And we met somewhere in the middle. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm still a little upset that we didn't get a couple more Happy Days references in there, but I, I can live with it. <laughs> I can live with the, the, the big sit on it moment. <laughs> you, it is the climax. You're right. You treated that with, with a good amount of reverence. So, so I like it. Um, but how, how was that in comparison to what you do with your other theater writing partner? You, you said you do normally not work on lyrics. It's very similar, actually, very, what okay. we did. Uh, we have kind of a streamlined process when I work with my collaborators, and that usually helps us write things pretty fast once we have the idea. But we did exactly that. What we usually do is we, to talk what I do with the collaborators, what yeah, we yeah. do is we always meet. Uh, we, do, we just had a meeting last night, and we talk with the book writer, so the person that's writing the libretto. And we kind of determine what the scene is, what's the drama that we need to get across in this scene, and then we song spot and she will go away and she'll write a scene and she'll furnish us with a finished scene. And then we will kind of figure out, OK, this is where she's seeing a song. And then Kristen and I will start collaborating and Kristen will start with lyric vomit is what we call it. Like she'll just throw a bunch of words on the page, which is kind of what we did. Mm -hmm. And so 
then from the vomit, I will write a tune that could contain some of those lyrical shards. And then if she likes the tune and we feel that the tune matches the drama, then she will continue to write lyrics to the music. So we kind of followed that process almost to a T, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, it's it's almost a quasi scientific putting fitting things together process. Get the raw materials and then figure out how they work and put your Yeah, exactly. And it's great to have a routine like that because it's a little bit easier to get started on any given song. And so I think that held over. I think that that's pretty much exactly what we did, right? Pretty much. Yeah. It it took several weeks because both of us are busy and <laughs> This was right. not a top priority for either of us, but I'm I'm glad that we stuck it out and actually finished it and came up with something that is Me worth too. presenting. And, and also, I don't write lyrics, so it was, that was kind of a crazy challenge uh, as well, but also really fun. Yeah. I'm surprised how much I liked that process. I'm excited to finally get that Not movie out, too. That's been sitting on the shelf for, for months because I wanted to have the song included on it when we put it out, so that'll be exciting. Well, to thanks for waiting. I'm that. so excited to hear the finished product. Yeah, me too. Ah, I'm dying to hear it. Thanks, Dave, for laying down drums. <laughs> He's no gonna, we're going to make him do bass, too. Yep, on we'll that do nice bass as well. Bass, yeah. <laughs> yes! <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> um, what's that show that you're working on right now? Are you able to talk at all about the subject matter that you're writing about or anything? Uh, a current writing project or my orchestration project? The writing project that you were uh, talking about. So... Uh, I we so my collaborators and I over the last few years we we've written a, a children's show and that's finally starting to have some performances. They did it at UPenn uh, last winter and they did it at Penn State in the spring. Cool. And we moved on to a new project uh, about the founding of spiritualism by and the Fox Sisters. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, and so I I'm not sure how much I should give. Yeah, too yeah, much no, away don't don't give us away, but, but that's but basically that's cool. it just takes place in this interesting 19th century world in a hotbed of religious fervor, uh, and the core of it is kind of about the nature of belief. Like I, I was really interested in coming at it from the angle of uh, like w William James wrote a book called Varieties of Religious Experience, and it was basically vindicating people that have strong religious beliefs because it can actually have physical effects, whether or not it's a placebo effect or if there is a higher power, you know, the, his argument was, who gives a fuck? <laughs> the idea is that if you believe in something strongly, it can affect you physically. And so mm. that's what I was interested in when we started talking about this project. And I think it's kind of coming out in this, the play about belief. That sounds really interesting and relevant. Yeah. Soup's interesting. Yeah. I can't wait to hear more of that. Is there, a, is there a favorite show that you've ever played or like a professional high point? that you, you were just really proud and satisfied and you were like, ah, oh, I made it here. Oh, God. Uh, many, many things. Um, I, I mean, of course, like, being the associate on Bright Star was an incredible experience. Like, that was, you know, that, that was, was the goal, was to get to Broadway. Who? And so, Steve Martin, right? Uh, yeah, it was Steve Martin. So cool. I've played a bunch of shows. Like, I've, I've, I've worked, I've worked on probably about 20 shows between off-Broadway and Broadway in the last six years. Uh, and, you know, I, I, it was, wasn't always a chair. Sometimes it was like rehearsal pianist or staff mm -hmm. or like all kinds of different jobs. But it was nice to actually have my own chair on a show. It was short-lived, which was very sad. But that was, of course, definitely a watershed in, in my career as a music director because I said I, that's what I set out to do. Uh, in some ways, I feel like I chose this whole career of theater to Im impress like an, a high school girlfriend. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, theater. I, I'm going to do that. She's really into theater. I'm going to get into that. That's kind of how I, I dip my toe in. But then I kind of got obsessed along the way myself in this art form, and it was definitely like having a Broadway show was something I never thought I would do. Like I mm. thought that would never happen. And then, you know, by the time I was 24, I was very lucky. I was playing on Broadway and subbing and doing off-Broadway and Broadway shows. And so having my own chair, though, was definitely a, a high point. Um, but as far as, like, work that I've been so proud to be a part of, like, the first show I ever subbed is called Adding Machine. I think it's the most phenomenal thing that's ever been written. And uh -huh. uh, it's unbelievably interesting to me as a musical. And is, it, the content is so relevant. And I wish Broadway was doing that. Hmm. 
Uh, it's not. It's distinctly not. <laughs> <laughs> I've never but, even heard uh, of that show. But I wish it was because it was probably the most interesting thing I've ever played. Wow. Cool. Uh, and then, of course, there's like the great storytelling, like Peter and the Starcatcher. I subconducted that a bunch. And it was also just amazing storytelling. Like this job had me playing piano with one hand and a djembe with another hand and then <laughs> picking up a tooth ruler and scraping the piano to make sounds of a boat creaking, cool. then picking up a violin to make the sound of a door opening. Like I was doing Foley work and playing the piano with one other percussionist. And we're telling this whole story between Foley stuff and actual uh, piano and uh, pitched percussion instruments. So like, it was unbelievable. That sounds incredible. Really? It was the most wild shit I've ever done in my life. That sounds cool. Like, I, the amount of preparation I had to do, like, if I didn't feel like vomiting while I was practicing, <laughs> I felt as though I wasn't practicing hard enough. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was that, was, that was something. But also something I'm extremely proud of. Awesome. Well, how about low points? Do you have any professional low points other than our mouth sound improvisation that we just did? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's still hope for that. The there's still hope for that. that no, I know. My entire career. I'm going to retire once we start selling those tracks. On iTunes. <laughs> any any funny stories or like disasters that, that 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 have happened where you're like, oh my god, why I would rather be anywhere other than right here, right now. Um. <sighs> I mean, I, uh, and it, it, this yeah, doesn't I mean, have to be professional. Been this could be like where... school. <laughs> Profes- also, professionally, we want names and dates. <laughs> no, I'm, well, I'm no, thinking think, like I'm think thinking like just... high school, e- even included, or anything like that. I think my greatest <laughs> failures come down to more a um, a difference in character and an opinion and, and personality. It's a war mm. of personalities. And so sometimes, this is, the, this is one thing that I find interesting as a music director. And I would love to talk to other music directors. Actually, I do talk to other music directors about this. But, I, you know, like Dan Pardo would be an interesting person to talk to about this. But I feel as though one of the reasons that, uh, or something that I've come to terms with or have a hard time with, is as a music director, the concept of posturing. Hmm. It's like when a, when a cop... My analogy is this. When a cop pulls you over because you have a broken taillight, right, and they're mad, are they mad? Like, are you, re- are you really <laughs> mad? And so, like, what is the level of posturing that goes into being upset about stuff that doesn't relate much in the, like, against something like world hunger, you know? Right. Like, how angry totally. can I possibly actually be if somebody's just not getting this rhythm? And so... <laughs> It's hard for me as a music director to actually get mad because my personality is so not mad almost ever unless <laughs> it's directed at myself. And then I'm mad all the time. But, but outward negativity is just something I have a really hard time with. And I find music directors toe a fine line or any leader, leadership role, you toe a fine line of acting upset or maybe really being upset. Maybe it's that thing where you can really, uh, you can really kind of believe yourself into being mad and and figuring out what is the what's the the admixture of that and just having fun at work which is what i really love to do uh and so anyways it's just something that i find really interesting to talk about with other music directors but to get back to the question uh, i find that i think my low points have come from me wanting to be such a pleaser to other people that the whole product kind of just goes oh, sideways. I see. You know, like mm-hmm. I want to be so friendly and then and then the inmates run the asylum because I'm just trying to please everyone. Mm-hmm. And then you just, even if you're wrong, I think sometimes you just have to marry uh, a position. Sure. And I find a hard time doing that because I just want everybody to have fun. But if you're working with people that are so hell-bent on this opinion or that opinion, it gets really difficult. And the people management skills are the biggest thing that I've learned to um, cope with and get better at. That's, the bi- that's been the biggest struggle for me. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I would say more than anything else, that's, that's absolutely it. And sometimes, of course, I get into my head about my own musicianship, but I think that's more a product of personality because mm-hmm. you, can, you can really only play well, I think, if you feel comfortable, mm-hmm. I, don't know. I find anyways, mm-hmm. I find it very difficult. Yeah, if, you, to, if you're yeah, on edge, if you're on edge it's hard to slip into that stream. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and that's why subbing is so fucking hard. Oh my you know? god, yeah. I started out subbing on Broadway, and that's just you get there's no there's no rehearsal for you. <laughs> you know, you're just playing with a recording, and then you're doing it live. And if you're playing a key one part, you're leading a band of people that are in their 40s, <laughs> 50s, and 60s that are extremely talented, tight musicians, mm-hmm. and you are kind of running their ship in a way when you're playing a keyboard run one role it's not as crazy as playing drums like that'd be the most terrifying thing but there's a certain amount of leadership that you just have to buck up and get in there and act the part and it's terrifying it is not fun i bet i will say i'll be the first to say that's why i try not to do it anymore i haven't subbed in four years yeah if you're not trying to break in i I can see that not being too desirable yeah exactly there's some people that just have a personality for it that are so um like, I love people. Yeah, people like that... jumping out of airplanes, too. <laughs> yeah, totally. But there's people that just don't give a shit and will sub a show mm-hmm. night after night or sub different shows night after night, and they don't care at all. Like, they find it easy, and I'm just, <laughs> I'm certainly not that. Yeah. I'm so meticulous that it's just so hard to keep the bandwidth to do a bunch of different shows. Gotcha. Yeah. So Is the there adrenaline a sh- junkie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. There are people that are just such that. And that I love those people. Those people fascinate fun me. Fun to be around. <laughs> fun, fun to be around. Absolutely. And often those are people that get gigs. Because if you're good enough, you just and, pile it on. And confident enough. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Is there? I want to be confident. I want to know what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know we're all about making music in a short time frame on this podcast. But this next track has actually been in the works for several months. First, we recorded a not movie and created the story and characters. Then, Anthony and I collaborated on the lyrics. He composed the bulk of the music, piano, vocals, and MIDI drums. Then, I wrote and recorded the horn lines. Dave came up with the bass part and recorded that along with the drums. And then we sent it off to our special guest vocalist and number one fan, Dan Pardo, to lay down the vocal melody. I think he conveyed both the drama and the silliness beautifully. Excellent work, Dan. Thank you. And if you haven't listened to Dan's episode, go back in our feed after you're done here and check it out. And if you want to hear the backstory for the troubled young hero you're about to meet in this song, head over to my other podcast, Not Movies, and check out Who Stole Henry Winkler. That episode features Anthony as well and one of his co-hosts from Let Me Ask You a Question, and it's a really fun one. Okay, enough talk. Here's When I Meet the Fonz. Mama, you're my everything, you provide me with so much. Food, clothes, shelter, love and care, all with a tender touch. You comb my hair, brush my teeth, massage me till I squeal. You say a mother's duty is to keep her son like veal. And when you're finished preening me, you'll turn the TV on And have me sit between your legs while panting for the fawns Happy days indeed Oh mama, oh mama, oh mama Mama, mama, please wake up, tell me it's not true. Mama, mama, please return to your normal grayish hue. Mama, mama, I feel a void in my belly. The only one who can save me now is Arthur Fonzarelli. When I meet the Fonz, It's like I'll start anew He won't sit with me and hold my hand While going number two When I meet the Fonz He'll teach me to tie my shoes And when I finally get it right I'll beat those dead mama blues Cause I know he's the coolest And he'll always be my friend I meet the Fonz This sad chapter will finally end When I meet the Fonz I hope that he'll conclude Instead of baby burden It's to let me chew my own food When I meet the Fonz Maybe he'll let me pick my own clothes 
shoes Hope you swap leather jackets for mom's hand-me-down pantyhose We all know he's the coolest I'll be just like him, you see When I meet the fans, I'll show him the all-new me I'd be glowing a bit When they call me the agoraphobic, incestuous son of a monster again I'll say Sit on me Is there a show that you've never gotten to play that you would really love to? Or is your is your dream project something that doesn't exist yet? Is it something that you, you need to make? I think it's more the latter than the former mm -hmm. because some of the shows I've worked on have been have also been the best things I've ever heard. Right. Yeah. And I'm extremely lucky that I just happened to luck into that. Like I always go back to Adding Machine. That came out in two thousand eight. It was the very first thing I ever subbed. And I, th I find it to be the most intriguing, fulfilling work of theater that I've ever heard and participated in. Wow. Um, and also, like, Bright Star, like, that, that sound world was so unique, this concept of bluegrass and finding different modes to tell stories. Because one thing that I don't love is kind of the generic popification of Broadway, mm -hmm. uh, which is just kind of... Um, I find too there's a there's a word that I need, but I'm just too dumb, so I'm not even gonna try. But it's just I'm gonna use sad, <laughs> three letter word instead. Uh, but I I think there's something that it's just kind of feeding on itself over and over again. This kind of world of pop, and I have a lot of strong feelings about pop and what pop is. I had a long conversation last night with a musician about like what that even is anymore. Mm -hmm. But there's something that's happening on Broadway that I just kind of find to be not interesting. And it sounds all kind of like one thing. Yep, right, yeah. Which is not well, what drama should do, I think. I think drama should tell really unique stories and have really unique voices. Totally. And I think like using bluegrass is such a mode that is going to tell a particular story. Or Hades Town now with Anais Mitchell. Unbelievable. I saw it and I loved it because it's such a unique voice. And she chose something really particularly interesting because it works so well with what she does best. Like her lyric, her lyrics are often poetry, which doesn't usually work in theater. But when you're telling a myth, it works so beautifully well. Um, well, I think I think the good part of that is, you know, uh, of course, I would love to see the scene be more diverse as well, and and have all of those things be really, you know, diverse and interesting. But if you think about it kind of in, the, in, in terms of the film industry, you have to have these big blockbusters that are sus sort right. of sustaining the industry and almost subsidizing these more independent things or things that don't get as much attention. So at least we're getting them. At least they're out there. And, and if you can plug yeah. into them and seek them out, there's a lot of great theater to be had still. Yeah, and some of the cream does rise to the top. It's like, I think, I think Hades Town was so worthy of all the Tonys it, it won. I really loved the storytelling. I thought it was unbelievable. Nice. Um, do you see, but anyways, do you see so, yourself, go ahead. Do you see yourself living in New York for the rest of your life? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Do you both? I love it. I, I, it's an interesting question. Uh, I always saw myself, and I think, I think there's still part of me that wants to be like, a toothless old man that eats cantaloupe and cottage cheese at the nearest diner every morning, you know, like well into my octogenarian time, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I love that concept of being a through and through New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And I do find it very hard to leave. Um, but you know, it, just in like the last week I, I was at my sister's wedding last weekend and to be in a place that's not all buildings, I do go, <laughs> oh, this is nice. Because I didn't appreciate the Poconos at all. It's, I'm the same you know, way. I, didn't, so, yeah. I didn't go back to the Poconos until a couple of years ago. They had me be, be on, in the, the Hall of Fame for East Stroudsburg oh, Area School I'm District for music. I'm still waiting for, for that call. 
<laughs> oh, you're gonna get it's gonna it's coming for you. Where do you think hear the mouth sounds? <laughs> that's gonna be instant. That's an instant in. But I hadn't gone back, and so it was funny looking through the window, and it was fall, and I was seeing all this beautiful foliage in the Delaware Water Gap, and I was like, I didn't see any of this shit growing up. Yep, I totally took like, it for granted. Like if it wasn't a mozzarella stick or a piano, <laughs> I didn't see it. <laughs> and it, but it. I think I have a new appreciation that is kind of happening late. Like now mm. I'm kind of going, oh, there's something to this space and being alone kind of and, and more solitude in the wilderness. Like I think I would be equally happy at, at polar extremes, like to have mm. this life of the most ur- urbane existence and then the life of living in a cabin by the woods, but having food delivered still because I can't cook. Well, it's nice that the Poconos <laughs> and New York City are so close to each other. Yeah, you that can, is absolutely go back true. You can do retreats. There's virtues to be had in both in the those Poconos. worlds, for sure. But <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. I still think there's a world in which if I can do it, which is extremely hard to do because, you know, when, when you don't have a Broadway gig and you're cobbling, like I'm, and I'm listening to Dan's podcast, you know, you're just cobbling together this existence. And, and you're lucky if you can get by and still go out and have like White Castle. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, you know, like that's, that's a lucky existence. And then other times it just pours and you have a lot of work and you're set, but there's no in between. So I think you usually come out like kind of poor <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Like there's Hopefully 10 poor people, and happy. There's 10 people that own apartments, you know, is like how it feels. Yeah. Hmm. But that said, if I can do it, I would love to do it. I, I, I can't picture living anywhere else. I love New York City so much. Cool. I love... The contingencies. There's so there's so much variety in the people that you meet, and in and every person is its own universe that you come into contact with, and then to be on their periphery is always so fascinating because then you meet a hundred other people that you would have never met, and it's just it's mind blowing how that happens in New York City. Yeah, I think it's really interesting too. I I loved living there for the short time that I did when I went to school there, and uh, I don't think I would want to live there my whole life, but. But it really is so fascinating. I love that city. There's something yeah, to it. I, I, I love it. <laughs> it's not old on me yet. I, I absolutely love it. Cool. <laughs> but I guess that's kind of a non-answer. Like, if I can live here, I will. No, I mean, that, that's, that's <laughs> totally an answer. Like, yeah, I'll stay here as long as I can. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tough it out and, and keep doing it. And hopefully it'll work. That's a good answer. Yeah. I mean, part, part of the realization is that now, as a 35-year-old man... I woke up this year and said, oh, I'm a musician. But that happened <laughs> this year. It's how it, like, it got so real, you know, that I chose to do this yeah. with my life. Right. And I think I've been extremely lucky to come out the gate kind of in my early 20s and have a kind of instant, at least partial success and enough to sustain myself and get gigs. And I always wonder if I didn't get those first gigs that came right out the gate in my first... Er- years of my early 20s, would I have done this? Or would have that harsh reality have set in much sooner? But it took me until this year to say, oh, there's some times when you just don't, you don't have something in the bag that's going to make you a lot of money. And I've been extremely privileged to not have to deal with that concern. But in the last couple of years, I said, what is this to be a musician? And it's, it's kind of becoming a yes man. Like I, mm. I was so burnt out last year that I kind of took like four months off and didn't do anything. Wow. I just wrote a little bit. And uh, and kind of chilled out and said, what do I want to do? And then this year I said, I'm just going to say yes to everything. And lo and behold, I became kind of busy again. But, you know, it's an interesting thing to have that realization this late in the game because you talk about the concept of a second act. Like, what do you what do you do when it doesn't work out? And I just I, like I feel like that that specter is haunting me more now than ever before as I'm getting older and saying, I think I'm leveraging my elderly self against being able to have the energy to do this now hmm. and is that okay is the question hmm. i see yeah and, interesting. and i and i have to ask myself every fucking day <laughs> <laughs> if it's okay and i think generally i'm just i'm just saying yes well like, i'm you, just on board if you have no fallback your answer is going to be yes i'll do music <laughs> right like what the fuck am i going to do <laughs> it's like every person that i every other person i know as like going to coding boot camp, you know, mm-hmm. and and I said I I can't I wouldn't 
even be good at it. I, I don't know anything <laughs> about numbers or technology. I'm an, I'm an idiot. And I find this is like a frequent second act. But I'm wondering how saturated that market's going to be. Oh, uh, yeah. Plenty. Yeah, very. In the near future. What you can always fall back on is if you get started now, by what most people report, you should take off as a comedian by 45. Is what you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is what I should do. I still haven't even worked up 10 seconds. Yeah, you got to <laughs> You gotta pay your ten you gotta years go of dues yeah. still. Three three sets a night. You're in New York. You gotta start <laughs> start now, and yeah. in a decade yeah. it'll pay off. <laughs> I should. You know what? I, you know it's it's funny. It's like I I would feel more comfortable. I think, and this could be totally wrong. I have to know because I have to die. You know, like if I ever do the kind of like Eric and I always talk about whipping together like just like a a one minute two minute open mic set. Mm -hmm. Just to feel what it's like to die in front of everybody. <laughs> but I have the sneaking suspicion that it will be more comfortable than subbing a first keyboard book on Broadway. I think you're right. Uh, yeah. And so right. I'm like, I could die in front of these people. Like, that's fine. I, I think once you get traction, of course, it becomes a different game. When the heat is on yeah. and you become, have the taste. Then you of start expecting something success. of yourself. And then that's the Exactly. <laughs> But I think people just dread dying. But I have no... F I mean, just listen to me. <laughs> I, have no, I have no fear when it comes to words. It's, I'm much more of an eggshell when it comes to music. Like, I'm so much more precious about myself. Well, I guess that, that can be your fallback then. Give it a shot. If music doesn't work out, comedy is going to be your thing. <laughs> yeah, money is going to be flying at me. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to be building... I'm going to be using hundreds for kindling. Stock up on ramen. Next, next big gig you get, and then... <laughs> That'll carry you through your comedy career. Rum or ramen? Both. Both. <laughs> yeah. They mix they well. Rumen. <laughs> yeah. I want rumen. That would be delicious <laughs> and disgusting. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. It well, sounds like something that would be served at Margaritaville. <laughs> so this is something that I don't ask all of our guests, but I feel is appropriate for you. Do you have any questions you'd like? Are you going to ask me to like... take my shirt off? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions you'd like to ask us? <laughs> uh. Well, let me start by asking, like, because I'm just kind of curious, how many instruments do you both play? That's fascinating to me. People that actually can actually pick up other instruments and play them. Like, you're a woodwind doubler, Sean. Yeah. So, I mean, like, how many is that already? Well, the, the, the spectrum, there's a spectrum of proficiency there. So, uh, I'll tell you in order of how comfortable I am playing them in front of people sure. or, like, you know, how, how quickly I would take a gig on this instrument if someone asks me would be flute. Piccolo, probably saxophone and clarinet are both about the same. Um, yep. Guitar, depending on the genre, drums, bass. Nice. Um, oh, my God. I'm less Amazing. good at piano, but I can learn a piece if I need to. I, I, I can't play for shit. I can't read for shit. But if I needed to learn something, I can play it on the piano. Um, you, oh, no, ukulele I missed in there. I'm more comfortable on ukulele than I am on guitar or drums because i i yes. do a lot of teaching on that and i oh that's fine yeah. decent amount of playing um but that's about it i mean other random percussion things uh i don't think i'm leaving anything out no, that's pretty yeah <laughs> yeah um, what about you dave for me it's, it's pretty much like the the rock band uh staples so like my thing that i'm most at home is uh would be bass guitar uh and then yeah. from there i would say percussion um i studied like more classical percussion in, in undergrad. Um, but I'm pretty good at drum set. I really like hand drums, like djembe and stuff like that. If there's no sticks involved, my fingers can really fly and I can do a lot with that. Um, awesome. And then guitar and then piano. But piano is the kind of thing where like I teach a lot of children piano lessons, but uh, once you get to about like a level four <laughs> ability in piano, like Faber book four, I don't really teach kids beyond that point because I can't sight read it beyond there. And I, you know, I like to be able to walk sure. into a lesson and just be able to cold see what they're doing and talk it through with them and demonstrate without, you know, looking like an idiot. So. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you can walk into any gig and kind of just, you know, sit down and, and play what's on the page, like sight reading is my asset. That's the mm. thing I do. Yeah. I don't memorize anything. Yeah. Uh, partially because I think, you know, all, all of my, uh, uh, not drug use. <laughs> 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 I, I just, I feel like I don't have a memory for it. I, I think I, because I never had to develop that, 
It's always funny because I'm terrified. I live in fear of having a piano at a party and somebody asking me to play something. <laughs> really? I don't think I could play one song from the beginning <laughs> to the end. I can understand that. That's yeah. For uh, for me, what I find more often than not with my students is if I give them like there's so many piano books where they're like, I want to learn this song, um, and it'll be like you know a rock song, pop song, something. I pull out the chart. I'll start the first few measures by reading note for note what's actually there. And once I know they're not following, three, four bars in, I'm just comping the changes in ways that I find most interesting and most in the pocket. Yeah, like, of course. Inevitably, it's like, well, okay, we're going to go note by note when I teach you. But right now, to demonstrate this, like... Here's the sense of Here's it. the sense of Yeah, yeah. exactly. I'm so much more comfortable comping changes than... than yeah, of course. Yeah. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> May I ask you one more question? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will well. let you. Uh, what What would you fall back on if you can't do music at all? What would you two do? You know, I've thought about that a lot very recently. <laughs> 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 it's been talked you about very seriously in our house very recently, um, <laughs> and 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 I don't know. I I think if I were to like look and. And, and find some sort of career that's completely not music related where that I would be able to jump into without getting another degree. I, I'm not sure. I think I might want to do something that's either maybe I, I think I would, would need to feel like I'm doing some sort of good, whether I'm, I'm working at some sort of charity or even even something like. I would love to just be able to plant trees all day for a living. I don't know if that's a thing, but like, oh, I love that. Either that or like trimming trees and something like that is kind of interesting to me. And I know they get paid a lot because it is dangerous. Got a crazy <laughs> estimate to trim our tree. You can <laughs> do like an afford. Edward Scissorhands. You can do the topiary. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, that's that's the first thing that comes to mind right now. But I don't. I don't. That I really sounds don't so know. peaceful. It would be it would be an interesting journey, and I would have to get into that mindset of like, all right, I'm really going to start over, and and I think it would be exciting to think of all my possibilities. But I, at this point, I don't quite know what I would. It, isn't it crazy? Do. It's so it fucking crazy. crazy. All right, Dave, how about you? Yes, um, <laughs> this is kind of like with my train of thought the last few years was uh like i I love teaching so i know my instinct is always to teach like that's what i want to do is teach collegiately but um you know like there was that that question i heard you mentioned for your own career like could i sustain this at 60 do i want to be sustaining this at 60 and that's where i'm always like do i want to be an adjunct teaching 20 students a week on the side when i'm 60 (laughs) fuck no (laughs) like like, it's like that's so i'm currently in the vein of like i need to get that that last degree because I need the job security. Yeah, that's the a master's degree won't get you anything in this field at this point. Um, so you would get a PhD in pedagogy, or uh, what? so no. So that's where I'm currently. What I'm actually hoping is to go back for a PhD in comp. Um, oh, in comp. But um, mainly, just I've been teaching you know adjunct for five years now or so. But uh, wow. um, but you know the adjunct game, it's just it's oh, yeah? yeah freelance. It's brutal. Yep. I mean the whole the college industrial complex <laughs> yes. problem is fucking crazy that's and, a good way and to very it. depressing and difficult yep well Absolutely. that's the the weird thing for me kind of in uh sean mentioning like uh trees and stuff like that if, if i was completely divorced from music doing something entirely different i feel like i would find myself going into some trade um because i really like working with my hands and that's one thing that like when teaching and composing a lot of that is like sitting stable in one place. You're crafting something, but it's all very abstract. Right. I would love something where I'm working with my hands, where I'm actually like at the end of the day, like, look, I made this thing or look, I repaired uh. this thing. Working with my hands in that regard, every time I get an opportunity to do something like that, it always is fulfilling. Um, what a nice feeling that that would be. Yeah. <laughs> Just have a concrete I, such product a person. at the end of the day. Your, your labor what was that? Yeah, to have a product. Yeah, I know. Something it's that you a, just hand. That would be, be like, an unbelievable is, yeah. feeling that I've never had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, there was tech shop, but I like even tech shop. We were rummaging through old artifacts in, in my, my in an attic a few months ago, yeah. and we pull out this thing that I made in shop, and and Meredith was like, "What is this? <laughs> was it a keychain made of plastic that you melted and twisted?" <laughs> I think it was, it might as well have I been. I one of those. I think it was supposed to be a bookend. 
Okay. <laughs> but it was hard to tell. Like it function it had no utility. Yeah. Like it, it looked like this misshapen piece of shit that I'm sure I didn't get a good grade on. And so it's terrifying because I'm I'm a useless human <laughs> when it comes to anything that is non music or talking related. I only exist in the world of ideas. I'm so bad in the, the <laughs> physical world. Well, maybe eventually we'll just be all hooked up to the internet and you can just be ideas floating around in the internet and make your Yeah, like that the way. Matrix? Yeah. That'll work out. <laughs> like a happier Matrix, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for, for telling me that. It's, so, it's, it's nice to uh, kind of have a, ther- a group therapy <laughs> totally. with other musicians about, you know, what the hell we're going to do. when Like when you wake up and you're a 35-year-old man and you say... I'm not going to be able to retire. There's not going to be any retirement, so I better really love this. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, and I think as of now, it's like, I think for me personally, I'm not ever bored of playing piano. I always do feel kind of alienated from it. Like I always like hmm. sit at a piano and I'm like, I can't believe I play this instrument. Like it just feels so weird hmm. to me. But also it's it's been the catalyst for so many rewarding things and relationships. I find it to be so much more about relationships uh, for mm-hmm. me like i like the creativity involved but actually just sitting and playing the piano it's like it feels nice to nail something like that's mm. a great feeling yeah but it's funny like I, I i constantly because i do it so much i kind of can live in this world where i'm at once playing the piano and thinking about how weird it is that i know how to play this <laughs> <laughs> it's like your weird superpower that helps you make friends Totally. I mean, it's, it's gotten me, it's opened up all the doors. Like everything came from the fact that I play the piano, but it's, it is a funny, it's a weird, very complex relationship I have with that instrument. So if you're here because you're a diehard Lamayak fan, you'll already know that Anthony is kind of obsessed with mouth sounds. So we decided to do an improvisation using just those. Now, it occurred to me after listening back that Anthony, you kind of broke our rule a little bit because he used some mouth sounds that technically came from his vocal cords and not his mouth, but we're not going to hold it against him. The original plan was to use some effects on this, but we're actually going to present this one with basically no effects at all. No reverb, no compression, no EQ. All I did was adjust the levels so they were even and pan myself to the left and Dave to the right. We decided to go with this version because it highlights the almost grotesque absurdity of three men in their 30s with advanced music degrees making mouth sounds together in their spare time. However, a couple other versions of this track do exist. One that's full of a long reverb that just sounds like we're doing something really weird in a cave. And there's a version where I just went totally over the top with crazy effects and we don't even really sound like humans. If either of those sound like something you'd like to hear, just share this episode with your friends on the social media of your choice. Tag us and I'll send you the alternate versions. If you're on the other end of the spectrum, however, and you have a touch of misophonia or any kind of problem with mouth sounds or chewing sounds or anything like that, you're going to want to skip forward a minute and 31 seconds, starting now.
very last thing I wanted to um, touch on are your listening habits. And and I, I think I remember hearing at, at one point on Let Me Ask You a Question that when you were in high school, your listening habits were very narrow and you only listened to a few different genres. And has that expanded since then? What do you what do you like to listen to right now, like to, to kind of get you away from whatever you're working on actively? Ooh. Or is it just podcasts? <laughs> is, is it, Hold on. I don't listen to music. You listen to Jerry Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would love... <laughs> that does sound like Jerry Lewis. That's funny. <laughs> um, it, I go through phases. I certainly go through phases. There are perennials that I always return to. Uh, in high school, absol- you're absolutely right. If it wasn't Mozart, I, I wasn't listening to it almost at all. Mozart was... I was fanatically obsessed with Mozart. <laughs> and to some extent, I still am. I don't listen to it as much as I used to or listen to his music as much as I used to. But I mean, then I got to college and I found Paul Simon. And then I was under the... Then I was under, have of the opinion that there was like... There was Mozart and then there was Paul Simon. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's a, a pretty yeah, skewed yeah. view of music. That's, that's a very <laughs> direct line. No yeah. steps in between. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, and what I listen to, it's just, I think I'm always down to listen to mo- like 20th century music and what 20th cent- and 21st century composers are doing. Like I mm-hmm. find that very interesting and I don't always love it, especially the kind that sounds like super academic. Mm-hmm. Like I was just talking to somebody that's going to school at Eastman right now and they're still totally like, if it's not serialism, it's not music. And I, I just couldn't <laughs> believe insane. that that was still an opinion <laughs> that people would have at a conservatory. It's unethical um, to be training yeah. people in that. <laughs> right. It's just the museum of that is so crazy to me. But so I'm always down to listen to 21st century music. There are times when I, I go on Spotify or whatever and just listen to what came out this week. Hmm. But I think I'm just I am disheartened by... The flatness of what pop music like those those the kinds of things are right. like there's just something that sounds kind of of the same cl- that's not, such a shitty thing to say because i'm sure there's people and if you know the artist you love the music but <laughs> there's something that sounds kind of similar and so i'm always interested in like weird stuff mm-hmm. it's why i constantly return to adding machine which i find to be a wonderful piece of theater and interesting music and i think you can have it all um but to to, to like figure it out it's like wildly I listen to so much different shit and it gives me so much stress about what the hell I am. <laughs> like, I don't know what my voice is because like, let me tell you, like some of my favorite shit of all time. Yeah. Like Mozart. Then there's Paul Simon and I fucking love Paul Simon. And then there's like these, this British duo called Flanders and Swan, which was, were a comedy duo in the 1950s. <laughs> and I find their songs to be the most wonderful things ever written. I'm going to write that one absolute down. Gems. What was that? I'm going to write that one down. Oh, listen to Flanders and Swan. They, to me, are the epitome of wonderful songwriting. Huh. Listen to the Armadillo. Okay. <laughs> I will. And listen to Miss Alliance. They're both wonderful, wonderful songs. Um, and then, you know, and then at the same time, I'm listening to whatever, like a, a friend of mine that's a composer sent me music to listen to last night. And so they, my tastes run in so many ways that I, I feel so schizophrenic that often I find I'm paralyzed and don't listen to anything. Gotcha. Yeah, I listen to a lot of podcasts. <laughs> I listen to a lot of podcasts. Absolutely. I'm a big podcast fan. Um, but it's difficult because I definitely go through phases where I'm relentlessly listening to music. But it's always, I'll listen, I'll find something and I'll listen to it like a thousand times mm-hmm. over yeah. and over again on repeat. Yeah. Yep. I do that too. Uh, and then it's nice, to, uh, then, I'll, then I'll forget about it. And then it's nice to kind of come back a couple of years later and be like, oh yeah, I, I still know all the words to this. <laughs> This is like yeah. meeting up with an old friend I haven't seen in a while. <laughs> right. And that's always nice when you have a renaissance with somebody that you know and love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a really, it's difficult to pin down like what that is. I think and it's then hard it's when you're always in terms li- of a composer as being a composer. Like what, right. who am I? Yeah, I don't always, know who I am. You know, it's listening. like we're living in an age that's unique in so much as our, our predecessors can be anything we want them to be. Mm. It's not like something's popular, right. you know? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Well, yeah. that's about all I had. I know you could talk forever, but uh, the people can't listen forever. <laughs> so we're going to have to say it's goodbye. It's so true. 
<laughs> but uh, well, thank you so much for having you're me welcome. on Good the podcast. I've had a wonderful fun. time. Yeah. Fun. Do you want to um, plug your show? I, I already we already mentioned it several times. Is there anything else you want to plug or direct people to your Twitter or your Instagram or anything like that? Sure. I mean. If you want to follow, let me ask you a question. We'd be much obliged. We love our little podcast that we've been working on for some years now. It's been almost three years. Wow. We've got so many episodes of Let Me Ask You a Question. So follow that if you're into just kind of general, jolly, silly, good times and a series of thought experiments. Uh, then that is your that's going to be your show. You're going to love it. <laughs> Uh, other than that, you can follow me uh, on on Instagram at Anthony Doing Stuff uh, if you're into that kind of a thing. And yeah, as far as projects go, I'm currently orchestrating music for uh, an album that's going to come out around Christmas time for somebody that his name is Randy Rainbow. Oh, He's kind of yeah. become um, mm -hmm. a big parody artist, and he was on Fresh Air a few months ago. He's been on he was on CNN, and he's doing his first Christmas album, and so it'll be like. Kathy Griffin's going to be on it. That's awesome. Norm, Norm Lewis Theater and Alan Cumming is going to be on it. Oh, wow. And, um, so I think I'm going to, I'm doing some charts for that. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. Awesome. Maybe I'll be fired. It's hard to say. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, so there's little things percolating here and there if you want to, if you want to get at me. Beautiful. All right. Well, thanks again. Yeah, thanks. See ya. Thank you so much for listening to Sean and Dave make music today or tonight, or this morning. If you liked what you heard and you have an extra five minutes to spare, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. Also, please continue to spread the word with your friends and colleagues if you think they might be interested in what we do. If you have any questions or comments or would like to submit a prompt for us to improvise off of, please send us an email at seananddavemakemusic at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. Just search Sean and Dave Make Music, write out the word and instead of using an ampersand like our logo. Don't forget to check out Anthony's links to find more of his music and his podcast, Let Me Ask You a Question. Then head over to Not Movies to listen to us come up with the story behind When I Meet the Fonz. That episode is called Who Stole Henry Winkler? Also, check out our special guest Dan's YouTube show, Pardo's Turn. I'm always happy to plug that because it's so good. You won't be disappointed. Watch any of the episodes. They're all good. We'll be back next month with more music and another fantastic guest. See you then. Sound is all around us. Sound is all around us, everywhere. That's for me, the nature of sound. All right, I'm going to stop recording now. Me too. <laughs>